part of the hook that I try to portray to you about the necessity. Um, sometimes we talk about concepts and practical matters. And sometimes it's the obligation of lecture to focus on the concepts to try to get you a, an idea about the big picture. And that's certainly true today. Um, the practicality of this is that the homework assignments and our activities that we enter into all week long to try to see these big concepts are not the hardest thing we've done all semester long. In fact, um, they're quite achievable. They're, if this is a roller coaster we're on from the last <coughs> test to the final, this is one of those lulls, easy things that a whole lot of people can catch on to. Now, it's more appropriate to say this at the end, but I'm going to say it now because I'm thinking of it now, and I may not have time at the end to have your attention. Um, as you leave today, there's another handout, and it's green. Um, it's hot off the press. I mean, literally, I finished it last night, this morning, had it copied. I videoed this morning, last hour, what I'm calling an extension to lecture. There has never been... Uh, okay, okay, let me start that sentence over. Six out of eight lectures you've experienced this year, including this one, end with some sort of demonstration, some sort of practical application of the big picture we're talking about. It didn't happen that way in the inventory chapter, so I did what I called an extension. Gave you a handout at the end and encouraged you to do that before you did your first homework assignment. And this lecture has never had an exercise to do at the end. So I had the brainy idea over the weekend to try to pull it off, and I have almost. It's not on the, the videos. I've taped it, but I haven't dropped in all the slides and stuff to make it work, okay? So hopefully this afternoon, maybe tomorrow, I don't know when I'll get it finished or not, but I'm hoping that it will benefit you before your first homework assignment. That was my intent to do a short, quick introduction demo for you to benefit from an exercise before you try to do your homework. And if I get it pulled up, good. The topic is internal control. And the application of that is with the asset cash, okay? So big broad topic. Let's talk about what internal control is. It is a very difficult concept to wrap our thoughts and identity around. It's hard to define what internal control is. In more practical ways, it's an attempt that we make to divide up the company in such a way and assign tasks and responsibilities to those people to safeguard our company. When you're the owner, you're the idea person, you're the manufacturer, you're the bookkeeper, you're the salesperson, you're the one who packs the packages and opens the mail and does everything, you don't have an internal control system. But when you hire your first employee, it's your job to say what you're going to do and what you're going to have your employee do. And when you hire the next employee, then you need to divide up the task and responsibilities between the two of them and so forth until all of a sudden you're a middle-sized company or a large company and you're concerned with the duties and responsibilities that you're going to assign. If you don't design a good system, employees are going to beat the system. Trust me. The key to this is hiring good quality people to carry out these tasks. We need to be very direct about what we expect of people. We need a policy manual. We need it in writing what they're to do. And we need to make sure that we have this good system that will ultimately protect the assets that we have, protect us from incurring liabilities that we shouldn't or pay liabilities that we shouldn't. And when we do, the fallout from that is that we're also giving credence to the revenue and expenses that we record and therefore making the financial statements more reliable. Whew. That was a long sentence to get to the conclusion. That's the goal. Can we trust the system? We must be able to trust the system to have a good output 
that the financial statements would be reliable. And it's called internal control. The big thing is internal control. So I only left you two blanks on the handout, but let me fill in a lot of blanks. Be careful about which ones you write down. Don't write them down yet. Have you heard of the Great Depression? Sure you have. Government responded with all sorts of ways to try to help the depression and help us get out of that. Often when there's this big calamity, government comes up with some sort of response trying to fix it. The stock market crashed and government formed the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it's still around and it's supposedly the watchdog of Wall Street. So companies have, that are listed on the stock exchange have to report their earnings quarterly and that's been in place a long, long time. Now the real two questions that I put the blanks in the note taking guide were for, have you ever heard of Enron? Say yes or no. Yes. Hands above your head. Who's heard of Enron? Good. If you haven't, go Google it. Who's heard of WorldCom? Hands up, let me see. Not quite as many. You ought to go Google it. Okay, you ought to know about some things that happened in the early 2000s. You were born. Okay? Um, these two terrible things that happened in commerce, in business, happened so close together that the government responded. Do you see my parallel here? The stock market crashed, the government responded, and we have the SEC. Enron and WorldCom happened, and the government was responded with two congressmen's names, Sarbanes and Oxley, the two men who sponsored the bill that became the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And it's abbreviated, nicknamed SOX. And when you get on a job, it is highly likely that you will run into some people saying SOX who expect you to know what it is. And we're not going to spend all week talking about Sarbanes-Oxley. This is going to be it in about 30 more seconds. But Sarbanes-Oxley was the government's <coughs> attempt to impose internal control. Up until that time, the profession, management, business, and accounting, had been responsible for the internal control system in the company. And the ethical violations were so bad in Enron that not only did Enron go broke and hurt a whole bunch of people, but the CPA firm that was auditing them went out of business and hurt a whole lot of people. A whole lot of people. I mean, a whole lot of people is not nearly a strong enough statement for the people who lost their retirement, who lost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars personally each. It was a terrible thing. And it needed a response. So, now whether that's appropriate for government or not is something for you debate, to debate elsewhere. I'm telling you what happened. And this is the environment in which we work now, the emphasis was placed not just on the accounting team to have internal controls or to examine them or the management team, but it's throughout the company. It's from the board of directors all the way to the janitor. Everybody is affected by Sarbanes-Oxley and how the business is to be run because of that. Now. We take that as a small introductory internal control is a still a big topic, but then it boils down to how are we going to get our hands on this? How are we going to apply it? I'm not going to talk about it a lot in class. I'm trying to whet your appetite. I'm trying to encourage you for once to read the chapter. <laughs> so, and to read about the controls that are described and why in the book? Why are we trying to set up the business this way? What benefit would there be for adopting this practice or this practice? It's hard for us to have a homework problem about that. It's hard to make that practical. It's more of a readings, less of an application kind of an understanding. You'll want to know a little bit about it. You should. 
sometimes it's easier to see what internal control isn't than to see what internal control is. I've got just a few examples to share with you. I used the example a moment ago of one person business or hiring an employee or hiring two employees or hiring more than that. As we begin to have duties that we can share among employees, what are the classic ones that we want to separate? We don't want the same person doing both those things. I've got just an example or two to try to get you to just barely understand it. Having the same person in charge of receiving cash and maintaining the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger is not a good combination. That's something that you could divide among employees and have a control. When you put those two activities in the same person, you lose control. Let me see if I can illustrate it. So here's the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Remind me somebody, I'm talking to myself really. The next time I think about leaving out the special journals and subsidiary ledgers chapter, this is one good reason we need to keep it. Imagine not doing what we did last week and not knowing what a subsidiary ledger was and trying to understand this. It wouldn't have worked. This is the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger and these are customers who owe us money. And we've got a very well-trained, reliable, trustworthy employee. Single mom, we'll say. Several kids. Financial pressures. Handling cash of the business every day. No problem for years and the kids are sick and they need a prescription and so the employee thinks all right I'm handling all this cash every day customer pay a pays a hundred dollars the employees got the hundred dollars <coughs> they post fifty dollars to the customer's account and keep fifty dollars to go pick up the prescription at the drugstore so that the child can get well and fully intending to pay it back on Friday. The customer B pays a hundred dollars nobody noticed so the employee decides to keep fifty dollars no not yet we post fifty dollars of that to A's account and fifty dollar to B because if we mail A a statement and it says that A still owes $50, A's liable to call the boss, and then the story's over. You got caught. So we're trying to keep A happy, post $50 of this to A's account, now A's balance is correct, post 50 to B's account, and we're running a little behind here. Then <coughs> customer C pays $100, we post 50 to B's account, good, caught up, that's okay, and $50 to C's account, oh, I gotta remember that, run a little behind there. And as I said a minute ago, a little ahead of time, nobody notices. So a week or so later, by now I fully intended to pay it back, nobody's noticed yet, so things are tough at home, some other emergency comes up, and the employee keeps $50 out, and post $50 to C, we're caught up on C, but now I'm running behind $100. Y'all see where this is going? This is a classic example of fraud called lapping. Lapping. And I'm not sure there's a place for it on there. Maybe there is. You can write the margins, can't you? Can you imagine, can you, Ray Greg, imagine the phone call home this afternoon, uh, let me save that for one second. The employee over here is the boss bragging on the employee, oh, this is such a great employee. You know what she did? Last summer she was so loyal. She knew I was needing people so badly that she didn't go on her vacation. She stayed here and worked through her vacation. She knew, to, knew I needed her so badly at the company. No. She didn't want somebody else to sit in her chair. She was afraid she'd be found out. This is the part I got ahead of myself a second ago. Can you imagine the phone call home this afternoon? Hey mom, guess we, what we learned in accounting today? We learned how to commit fraud. 
I didn't even get a chuckle out of you? <laughs> Did you not catch on to what I just said? Do you think I came to class today to teach you how to commit fraud? No. Is that what the phone call's really gonna sound like? You just scared me. <laughs> Did I come to class today to teach you how to commit fraud? Yes or no? no. What did I come to class today to do? I'm hoping to tell you how to prevent fraud, not how to commit fraud. Do you understand why you're here today? Yes or no? Yes. Now, I, I, I'm really not even going to accomplish that. I'm not. I, I'm just giving you some examples to raise your antenna, to raise your awareness level, to give you a heads up, <coughs> to make you more aware. It's a mean world out there, and if we aren't on our best behavior, on guard, we're going to be taken advantage of. You don't want cash receipts and accounts receivable in the same person, nor do you want cash receipts and credit memos. So you're smart enough to divide up the collection of cash and maintaining the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. You tell those employees, do your own work, don't share ideas, don't cover for each other, and then in this employee who's collecting the cash, you say, it's okay for you to write credit memos. I can tell you the same story. Remember the single mom who had financial trouble at home? She doesn't, she has her hands on the cash, but she can't lap in the subsidiary ledger, but she can write fake credit memos. So she writes credit memos and hands them to the other person, and the other person posts it to the subsidiary ledger, and she covers her tracks. That's equally bad and offensive. Well, change perspectives a minute. I've been talking about collecting cash. How about paying cash? We're vulnerable when people make up fake companies or pay fake invoices. We need some control over that. I have a few regrets in my life. Most of them revolve around throwing things away. It's turned me into a pack rat. I didn't keep this newspaper article, and I wish I could show you the very one, but I read in the newspaper that I later threw away about a company downtown whose name you might recognize if I said it. It's not important. In the newspaper, it said that the auditors discovered by chance that one of the employees who was responsible for paying the utility bills for all the holdings of this company, and they are vast, was bringing her own utility bills home from home and putting her own utility bills in the stack so that when she wrote the check for the company to pay off the utility bills, she was paying hers from her house as well. What a good idea, <laughs> if you're a crook. What a bad idea if you're trying to run this company in an honorable way. Y'all with me here? So, I didn't push the buttons enough times. Here she's paying the utility company. We move on. Having cash receipts and preparing the bank reconciliation vested in the same individual as a conflict of interest. If you receive cash, somebody else ought to be reconciling the bank statement to check up on you. It's checks and balances. It's a system that needs strength and accountability in it so that we can rely on the financial statements better. Here's another story. This is my brother-in-law. And it is really he. That is my brother-in-law. And I have his permission to tell the story. He, his expertise is in used cars. In the West Texas area, he is very well known for his expertise. Um, I'll try to make the story somewhat short. I could tell you all about him that led up to this point, but he decided to form a company and have an auto auction of used cars. And he knew that he couldn't do it alone. He knew he needed somebody with expertise, and he hired an office assistant. This is not her and entrusted the office assistant with too many things. He was busy, 
He had to rely on her. Thought she was trustworthy. She was very knowledgeable in the industry, but apparently too knowledgeable of business affairs too. And he got a little suspicious, but no proof. He, biz, the business grew. He hired somebody else in the office to help her. And she was there a while, and she became suspicious and came and talked to him about it. He was already suspicious. Now he's got a little confirmation of this, and he starts paying more attention. On the day he fired her, he got there early and checked the cash bag in the safe. And honestly, I've forgotten the numbers, but there was something like $7,000 in the bag of cash that day, which was not unusual. Later in the day, he went and counted the cash, and there was like $3,000 in the bag, and there had been no deposit slip made that day. So he felt like he had, or he observed it. He fired her that day and attempted to learn from it and prosecute her and all these things. He needed some information that she had. They struck all sorts of deals. He hired an insurance company to help him recover the claim. Um, his view was if, ex no, he didn't hire the insurance company, excuse me. If he reported it to the insurance company, that the insurance company might have the idea of wanting to minimize the loss that occurred. He hired some experts in this kind of issue to come in and try to see what they could discover. And their view was to not start at the beginning. Their view was at the beginning, the employee is likely to be stealing very little. It's as the employee gets more brave and more brave, they steal more and more. So their investigation <coughs> view was to start at the end and work backwards. And when they got to where it was small enough that it wasn't worth it anymore, <coughs> they'd stop and not invest so much time. They documented that she stole about $40,000. And that may not sound like much when we talk about the national debt <laughs> or the deficit, but $40,000 to this <coughs> otherwise successful but kind of small business was a chunk, would be a chunk for you and me, no doubt. And he never recovered it from her or from the insurance company. It was his loss. He learned a lot from that experience. And that's one of the reasons I tell the story today. As another story that would help raise your antenna and raise your awareness so that you could be on guard when you are forming your own company or working in another company or having explained to you the policies of the company <clears throat> and wonder why they want you to do something. There are lots of good reasons why they tell you to do certain things. We all need to be aware of making the internal control system work. Even as a customer, we need to be aware that we are part of the internal control system. I see them lots of places. Uh, it seems to me that I recall seeing on the Brahms drive through window. If they fail to give you a cash register receipt, you get a free gallon of ice cream or something like that. I don't remember what the reward is, but that's reminding the customer that they're part of the process. I've got an illustration like that in a second. Here's an article I did keep out of the newspaper. A former Tulsa who now lives in Virginia has pleaded guilty to bank fraud and unauthorized use of a credit card in a case that will cost her $153,000 in restitution. Linda admitted in her petition to plead guilty that while working as an office manager for Christensen Aviation, they're right across the river at Jones Riverside Airport right now. She forged endorsements on checks and illegally used a credit card. She was named in a 109 count indictment that was unsealed on June 3rd. She pleaded guilty to only one of the two counts but the district judge will be able to consider anything he deems necessary to when he sentences her. According to her plea agreement, she will owe restitution to two banks, to Visa, to American Express, and to her employer. She claimed in court documents that she was hired by Christensen Aviation in May of 1996 
and that within a few months, catch this now, I noticed a total lack of financial controls. Did you hear it? I noticed a total lack of financial controls. I admit I saw the opportunity to take money, so I did. She said she received canceled checks as part of her duties. She admitted that on receipt of the canceled check, she would create a new check from the canceled check. She would then deposit the new check in one of her bank accounts. She said that about 12 times she issued credits on her credit card as if she had made a payment, as if she had returned something for credit. Oh my. Guess what we learned in accounting today? Did you get the point? And then I was preparing for class, I think it was two years ago, and that very weekend, this article was in the Tulsa World. I mean, literally, it would have been like Friday or Saturday of the past weekend when I knew I was about to come in and talk to you about this. Big art. Woman pleads guilty to $1.6 million theft. <laughs> We've gone from forty thousand dollars from my brother-in-law to this one, one point six million. This is one person. I'm not going to read it to you in the interest of time. I think you're getting the idea, are you? And they're in the paper a lot. Uh, one weekend, I think I clipped out three new ones that I could share with you. It's all sorts of people that you would least expect that we think are trustworthy and honorable. We need a control system that will safeguard the company, safeguard the assets and the liabilities that we incur, and make the financial statements even more reliable. We must be able to rely on the internal control system as it helps the accounting system. So let's talk about some procedures that are a small part of that that we take for granted. In chapter two, we learned about debits and credits, what we call the double entry bookkeeping system. And knowing that the trial balance balances is a very small part of internal control. Knowing that the trial balance is out of balance knows, suggests that you've got a problem. But knowing that it's in balance gives us some assurance of our efforts. We need to do that. Last chapter. We had a control account and a subsidiary ledger, and in your homework, you were asked to see if they agreed with one another. There was a reason for that. It's part of the internal control system. Knowing that the one person is keeping up with the subsidiary and one person is keeping up with the control and comparing those results gives us additional assurance of the accuracy of our work. We need that. We take cash, register, cash registers for granted. We think they're glorified adding machines, that they calculate the sales tax automatically. They're a safe place. And when we can get the employee to use the cash register properly, it's an internal control device. I thought of you on fall break a few years ago when I was in the Atlanta airport and I'm standing in line to get me something to eat in my layover and I noticed on the cash register, this sticker that says, if you don't get a receipt with the purchase, call this number. It just screamed of internal control. Didn't I say a few minutes ago, the customer is part of the internal control process. If that employee has been working half a day, don't you think they know what a combo number two cost? Yes or no? I bet it wouldn't take long to know what a combo number two was. And I don't think that in the airport it's unusual for somebody to be traveling alone and come up and order one thing. Well, so let's say a combo number two is six bucks. And you ring up the combo number two enough times to know it's $6.23 or whatever it is. And you remember that. So the next time the person comes up and says combo number two, you tell them the price. And they pay you, and instead of you putting the money in the cash drawer, it goes in your apron or your pocket. You just gave yourself a raise. 
Why is this so important? What does a cash register receipt do? If we force that employee to ring it up, if we know the employee it might say to the customer, $6.23, please, and not give them a receipt, but if we make them ring it up, they have to give them a receipt or they're going to call this number. If they ring it up, we got them. Now they're accountable. Now they've got to be responsible for what's in their cash drawer. <coughs> Did I make the point or not? Yeah. You watch. When you go through the drive-in lane, they're careful to give you a receipt these days. At some stores, there's a reward if you find out that they don't. You watch how many times they hand you a receipt with the change. It's an important part of internal control. Some of you worked as waiters or waitresses and been given a pad of guest checks where you take their order, numbering them and accounting for the numbers is part of the internal control process. We don't want the employee collecting the full amount at the table when they're supposed to pay the cashier. We don't want guests walking out without paying for their bill at all. It's an important part. We're, I'm talking about simple little things that are internal control bits and pieces. I, I, I suppose we've really assumed since chapter one that we're keeping the money in the bank account. But it's in this chapter we admit it. It's a good thing to keep the money in the bank. It's perceived to be a safe place to keep it. We don't want a lot of money around the office that would be vulnerable to customers or employee theft. So, it's a good sound business practice to keep it in the bank. The bank keeps a record, we keep a record, and therefore we can compare those records and explain why they're not equal and get them to agree with one another and have another one of those assurance levels that our work is good, that our financial statement is reliable. That process of reconciling the bank statement is part of the internal controls process. There are some problems with the assumption that all the money's in the bank. If all the money's in the bank, we've got a problem when the postman has a postage due letter and we don't have any money to pay it. Some companies make it a practice of keeping a petty cash fund, a small fund on hand from which legitimate disbursements are made and it's a good way to manage cash. It too needs to be controlled. We need to know about that. Of this big grandiose story from the stock market crash to Enron to WorldCom to my brother-in-law and all these other examples we're trying to glean what internal control is and how important it is in the life of the business but when it comes down to the nitty-gritty we're using reconciling a bank statement as the example of one teeny nitsy little itsy bitsy internal control procedure to get our hands on. Using a bank reconciliation, uh, determining, preparing, there we go, preparing a bank reconciliation is our primary objective this week. And as a sub lesson, we're going to talk about in homework and perhaps first discussion in my groups, a petty cash flow. Those are the two main topics of homework we need to know a little bit about. I'm going to focus in class today on the big broad thing about bank reconciliations. And I mentioned already that there's a handout and hopefully a video online soon about bank reconciliations that would get you off to a good start. To lead up to a bank reconciliation, let's talk a little bit about point of view. Let me draw a parallel. I'm trying to get you to see things from two different points of view that's not the first time this semester. Let me remind you that something we call accounts receivable from our point of view, they call, speak up, accounts receivable has a debit balance, accounts payable has a credit balance. I'm drawing a parallel. So something that we call a credit memo, they call a debit memo. You're getting the hang of this. Good. So something that we call interest expense, they might call 
Speak up. Interest revenue, interest income, whatever it's called. Different points of view. So let's say that I call it cash, or sometimes businesses literally use the account title cash in bank. I call it cash in bank. What is cash in bank? <coughs> cash to me. Asset liability, capital revenue, expense, say something. <laughs> What's its normal balance? <laughs> Cash to me is an asset. What is it to the bank? Daniel, you want to be the bank a second? What's this? What is it? Tell the class. A one dollar bill. Who's this? It? Here you go. Would you hold it for me a minute? So, whose dollar is that? Yours. It's mine. But he's holding it. So to me, it's an asset. You know, sometimes I think the confusion comes when we look at the bank holding our money, we think a dollar is an asset to whomever holds it. Is that a dollar to you? Can you go spend that? Well, you could, but then you'd for sure owe me, right? You owe me that dollar, don't you? So that's what I'm trying to get you to see about the bank. When we put our money in the bank, it's an asset to us. It can't be an asset to us and an asset to the bank, it's a liability to the bank. The, the bank owes us that money back. It's an asset to me. It's got a debit balance. If it's a liability to the bank, it's got a credit balance. And you need to know that and be aware of that as you live your life, but as you try to do homework this week. If you read something in the pro problem that says they credited it or they debited it or they did a credit memo or they did a debit memo, you've got to listen to who's talking and interpret it to how you're going to react. They're talking from their point of view. If the bank says credit, they increased your account and you'll need to increase your account. If the bank says debit, they decreased your account and you'll need to decrease your account. Are you with me right this minute? Say yes or no. Yes. It's just a different point of view. You need to be aware of that. I contend that the balance that we determine and the balance the bank determines will agree unless there are any of these two major things affecting it. I think every reason that you can think of that a bank statement won't agree with your records falls into two major categories. They are one, time lags, and two, errors. I want to talk about time lags and errors. Time lags. When one party has recorded it and the other has not, it's a time lag. I repeat, if you didn't see the hand motions. When one party has recorded it and the other has not, it's a time lag. If neither has recorded it, if both have recorded it, it's not a time lag. It's not a reconciling item anymore. When neither has done it or both have done it, it's not going to cause us to be out of balance. But when one has and the other has not, or one has and the other has not, it's a reconciling item. And if it's a check that I wrote and reduced my account but mailed it to New York City, it took a couple of days for it to get there. It took a day or so for them to process it. It took a couple of days for it to get back and for my bank account to know about it. And if the bank prepared a bank statement in the meantime, they didn't know about it. That's called an outstanding check. It's a time lag. Something that I've recorded that they have not. Or, let's say that I made a bank deposit at four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm still open. I'm going to record it today, June 30th. But tonight, during the night, the bank's going to prepare my bank statement. I'm a business and they know that I want it prepared as of the end of the month. And tomorrow they're going to process that deposit. They didn't process it today. That's a timeline. Something that I've recorded that they have not. I wrote it down. They haven't yet. That's called a deposit in transit. Now, why we didn't call them deposits in transit and checks in transit and be parallel, I don't know. 
Or why we didn't call them outstanding checks and outstanding deposits? I don't know. That's just the vocabulary that's the tradition that we use. A time lag that you've recorded that the bank has not goes on the bank side. Errors can be made by either party. We have the perception that banks don't make mistakes. And they do. They're human. They're, they're run by humans. They just have a really, 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 really sophisticated internal control system, and they generally find their mistakes before we find out that they made one. If there is a difficult part of this check, it is about errors. You need to make a determination today while I'm talking about this that you'll spend a little time this week beyond what's expected of you trying to learn about errors. There are two things you need to know about errors. One, who made the mistake? And two, the direction of the correction. One, who made the mistake? It goes on their side of the bank reconciliation. And two, the direction of the correction. That's going to be the hardest thing for you to analyze. The greatest area that you need practice, I'm encouraging you to do that. Bank reconciliations take this format. They start with two balances at the end of the month that are supposed to agree, but don't. This symbol was left out in the handout, not equal to. The balance according to the bank and the balance according to the depositors' records are not equal to one another. Could we explain why? That's what reconciliation means. Could we explain why? Well, let's start with the bank balance and let's add some things and let's subtract some things. One of the common things that we would add would be the time lag, a deposit in transit. You've recorded it, the bank has not. We'll subtract outstanding checks. You heard me explain them a few minutes ago. Outstanding checks are time lags. When we add some things and subtract some things, we'll get a new balance for the bank, the adjusted balance. And then we want to look at our side. Finding things to add to our side is difficult. The book and others use the example of a customer owes you money and you tell the customer to pay the bank directly, a note receivable. And it's a time lag because the bank knew about it, the customer paid them, you didn't know about it until you got the bank statement. <coughs> It's difficult to come up with examples of things that we would add to our side. Deductions on our side, maybe the bank service charge, maybe printed checks, time lags. Errors could affect either of these four positions. Two things you need to know, I've said them already. You need to know who made the mistake. It goes on their side of the rec reconciliation. You need to know the direction of the correction. Once you've decided on whose side it goes, then are you going to add it or subtract it? Errors are the hardest thing this week, and they're not that hard. When you subtract these deductions on your side of the reconciliation, you get the same, hopefully, you get the same amount that you got according to the bank side, and that's the amount that the general ledger should have in it and therefore the trial balance should have on it, and therefore the balance sheet ultimately. That's the true amount of cash we own. But that's the problem too, because right this minute, it's that beginning balance at the top of this side that we're showing in the general ledger account. We need to make adjusting entries for things on our side of the reconciliation. We don't make entries on the bank's books, but we do make entries on our side of the reconciliation. And there's several ways, three ways you could possibly approach this. You could make one journal entry for every item there. I think that might be the way the book illustrates it. There's nothing wrong with that. That might be the easiest way to do it so they don't interact with each other. One entry for everything on your side, the business's side of the bank reconciliation, not the bank side. Or you could try to make one entry for everything that's there. That's complicated. If you've got lots of things on your side of the reconciliation, making one entry to describe them all would be very difficult. 
I don't recommend that. My favorite way to do it is a compromise between those two. I like to make one entry for all the increases, debit cash, and credit a lot of things. And then one entry for all the decreases. Credit cash and debit things to explain why. I'll illustrate that this week. It's that way in the extension video. When you've done that, the bank reconciliation provides you valuable information. <laughs>